My name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye, and this is episode seven in a series of videos in which I answer your wildlife photography questions. Right, it is now Tuesday, and um, it's been an incredible weekend on social, so thank you for all the engagement. You had some good fun, and <laughs> I posted quite a few things on my upcoming travel. I'm off to Kenya next, uh, next week, today week actually, I'll talk about that at the end more, but some very interesting discussions happening around destinations, where you want to go, um, how many of you want to come and carry a bag when I go to Kenya, but we'll discuss that later as well. Anyway, for now, let's get into your questions. Athos Sede asked on YouTube, would a camera with a full frame sensor help to enhance my images in terms of noise reduction? I really struggle with noise, even at ISO 100. Athos Zede, this is a very interesting question because it's something that comes up quite often. Now, for me, there's a bit of a red flag here in your question in that you say that you start getting, you struggle with noise even at 100 ISO, which that shouldn't be the case at all, regardless of what camera you're using. Now, the important thing to understand here is that noise hides in dark areas. There's, sure, noise, this could be a very, very long discussion, but let me try and cut it down. You should be able to photograph on your camera, the, what was it, D5000 something, yeah? You should be able to photograph on that well up to 1000, also with correct noise reduction. You should be able to remove that noise while maintaining sharpness. The important link there is when you reduce noise, you're taking away edges, which could then make your image seem softer from a sharpening point of view. So there's that, that's a whole different discussion. But at 100 ISO, I would, I would, yeah. I think you maybe have to get that sensor checked because ISO 100 should not give you a lot of noise unless you are you're shooting in pitch dark and you bean bagging it and stuff. But still, no, it shouldn't happen. It's way, way too little. Remember, noise is a result of heat buildup in the sensor. So when you dial up from 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, when you dial that up, the camera is pushing more energy into the sensor, which makes it more sensitive to light and the heat, the byproduct heat, is the result of that noise. Now at 100, there shouldn't be that. So I would have that camera checked out just in case. The next thing, just to check off the list before we carry on, is I've had people that were, they've been on safari with me, and then they get home and I get a phone call and they're absolutely hysterical because all my photos are crap and they all look rubbish and nothing works and whatever, whatever. Now, when, when, when they then came into the office and we had a look, they were very, very harsh on themselves because they were looking at the raw file, unsharpened raw file, pre-post-production, everything. So nothing was done to this file. They were very harsh on their own images. So Athos, if you want to send me a mail, I'll send my email, put my email at the bottom here for you. Send me one of your raw files. Let me have a look at it and let's see if we can figure out if it's a camera issue. Maybe you're such a perfectionist that you are over judging the type of images or the, over, over judging the, type, the, the amount of noise in the image. But send me a high res uh, raw file, don't worry about the size, bomb it out and let me have a look and then see. I'll then drop you a mail back, I'll try and process it for you, see what we can do and maybe we can figure out if there is a problem with the camera. Anyway, backtracking, see I go down this rabbit hole and off I go. The, the real question is, will a full frame sensor help with this? You know what, possibly. In the old days though, when you had the 5Ds and the D700s coming into the market, there was a difference, there was a noticeable difference because there wasn't any extrapolation. The crop sensor wasn't then, it, you didn't have this magnification factor where the camera stretches open and it enhanced noise. So the problem is, not the problem, the nice thing is all the cameras these days are pretty damn good. So I would say, let's figure out first what's wrong with your camera, if there's something wrong, let's figure out there. And if you get to a point where you have outgrown your equipment, then I would say look at full frame, especially if it's from a noise point of view. If you're looking at full frame more from a landscape, wide angle, you want to go wide point of view, absolutely. I don't think the easy answer is just to get a full frame off the bat. I take, I take a crop sensor on every single trip I go. I just love, get that magnification. And noise wise, I've shot some of them up to 16, 3200. And when I've finished with it, there's no thing. So send me that file and let's dig around a bit. I, I don't think full frame is gonna solve your problem just like that. Kim asked on Facebook, Jono, on your conservation safaris, what is the most awesome thing that you have either done or experienced? Also, what does a rhinoceros' skin feel like? Kim, awesome question. I'm gonna punch this right to Jono and I'll be back after this.
Hi, Kim. Uh, Jono here. Sorry, thanks very much for your question that you sent through uh, regarding our conservation safaris and conservation initiatives. Um, first, I'm going to answer what does a rhinoceros skin uh, feel like. Well, it's actually quite weird because there's parts of the rhino skin that is very hard, obviously very rugged to protect itself from the terrain and the bushes that it runs through. But um, there's all parts of it, the um, softer parts underneath the belly, in the groins, underneath the front legs, on the actual um, neck. They actually are very soft. It's also very cool. Obviously, their, their cooling mechanism works particularly well. So it's, 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 it's an interesting uh, observation, and um, it's a great thing to get close to a rhino and work with a rhino and actually feel it, see what it's all about. Um, obviously, working with the vets, they do tell you a lot about the biology of the rhino, with the samples that they take to, to uh, the bloods or the, um, the tail. They take samples of the, of the tail um, uh, hairs, sorry, <laughs> um, tail hairs and um, clippings from the hooves and obviously the, the shavings from the horn. And they use that all for DNA testing. So it's a, it's a great experience getting down and dirty, as, as it were, with a rhino, um, moving it over, making sure it's safe that they can work on and that it's not in a position where it's going to restrict its breathing. Being up in the chopper while they, while they dart the rhino is an incredible experience. So, yeah, I hope I've answered that question. Um, most awesome experience on a conservation safari. I'll, I'll tell you one, one experience I had. We, um, um, we would, uh, Medikwe, in Medikwe Game Reserve, they were relocating two big male lions to, uh, to Pinda Reserve down in the KwaZulu Natal. And we darted these lions and we had to trans, uh, transport them to a boma which was situated in the south of the reserve, about, about half an hour's drive from where we actually darted them. We, um, they, we put them on a long wheelbase um, bucky, that's a pickup truck, pickup bucky, uh, pickup van for those of you internationally and um, we put these two lines and they asked us if one, two people could sit with the lines just to monitor their breathing. So there we were sitting on the back of this vehicle with the lions, watching their breathing uh, pretty closely, making sure they were all okay, comfortable and we got to the, the boma where we were, where we were going to release them and the, we found a, a hole in the fence which was a little bit concerning because obviously we then had to move them to the boma in the north of the reserve, which was about 45 minutes from where we were. Um, there we were sitting on the back of this vehicle uh, with a lion's head sort of lying underneath our legs. Um, and a funny thing, when a lion is, is tranquilized, it, 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 it doesn't really go to sleep. It's, it makes all its muscles and that inactive so it can't do anything, but those big yellow eyes are sitting glaring at you and all it wants to do is probably eat you. Um, so on, we, we, as I said, we had to leave this boma another 45 minutes. Um, the wind started coming up. There was a huge storm. We were sitting on the back of this vehicle, drenched, and all of a sudden these lions started to wake up. So you had these two big male lions lying underneath the legs, trying to lift their head and trying to get up, which wasn't so pleasant. Um, I spoke to the vet that was in the front of the vehicle and I said, please, let's give these guys another dose of tranquilizer. He said, no, we haven't got far to go. We've only got another 20 minutes. I said, well, I'm going to get eaten, so perhaps you should consider doing that. And he said, no, let's go. Um, so they put foot, um, accelerated a bit. Um, cut a long story short, by the time we got to the thing where I was trying to push these, this lion's head down with my mate on the other side trying to do the same because they were trying to stand up. And um, as we got into the boma, fortunately they, they, um, they hadn't done anything to us or bitten us yet, but uh, as we jumped off the, the bucky, these things suddenly got up and, and uh, sat on their haunches. So they were pretty awake when, by the time we got there, and that was an extremely uh, interesting experience, although a pretty frightening one. Cheers. So there you go. I mean... I've been lucky enough to, to, to join Jono and some other people on some of these trips in the past. And it is really, really, really special getting hands-on with the animals we see out in the wild in images and videos. It's a very, very special thing. If you ever get your, get your chance or the chance or a chance, definitely, definitely have a go at it. Uh, what does rhino skin feel like? It's, it's like rough and hard at the same time.
It's amazing. I think when you're also there, when you're working on this animal and you feel the animal breathing underneath your hands while the vet's working on them, wow, it's, it's, it's a special thing. Very, very special. Kylie asked on Facebook, how valuable would an education in animal behavior be to wildlife photography? Kylie, interesting question again. Um, would, it, would it help you to further you in the field of wildlife photography? This is a, a, like a master's degree or an education. I'm, I'm, I always believe that the more you know, the better it gets. And this is for anything in life. I mean, from when I was, I was in the health and wellness industry, um, the more you know, the better it gets. It's more interesting for you. Now, with both from a guiding point of view and from a wildlife photography point of view, the more you know, the better it gets. So the more you know about animal behavior, the better the experience is going to be for you and, by extension, guests, if, if you're taking them out. Um, if it's just for yourself, the more you know, the better your images are probably going to be because you can predict with a reasonable amount of certainty when and what's going to happen. That, and there's nothing better in the world, let me tell you, that as a guide, if you say to people, right, this animal's probably going to yawn now, lion, then he's going to get up, stretch, and walk around and go lay on that, on that side of the tree, and he does it textbook just like that. It's a great feeling. But it's all based on education and experience. It's having seen it for yourself, because you have to recognize it, but it has to come from somewhere. So is it a necessity? No, absolutely not. But I would, for one, if I had the opportunity, I would, and, and the time, it's a bit of a luxury, that time. Um, I would definitely go for something like that, because, again, there's going to be many times with wildlife photography where you're going to sit doing nothing. You're going to wait for an animal to do something, and after four and a half hours of waiting, it still does nothing, and you have to leave, for example. But the more you know about why it's still down, what could potentially happen, that to me is value. I, I find, and that's what I try and convey to some of the guests as well, is it's not just about the images that you get, it's about the process of getting there. And I believe that if you have that education behind you, that process of getting to the shot is going to be so much better. So, is it a necessity? No. Will it help? I actually think it will. Yes, I do think so. Sandra asked on email, can you please tell me the difference between the private and national reserves? Sandra, nice one, because not only is it an interesting question for some people who don't know, but there's big, big, big differences from an experience point of view, and I'm all about the experience of things. So what you get is national reserves and private reserves or private parks, yes? So let's talk South Africa, for example, now. Your, your national reserves, things like the Kruger National Park, the Khalakhari and those, they're all governed by Sand Park, South, Afri South African National Parks Board, and they're open to the public to go in and to self-drive, and they've got, generally have parks board accommodation, which you can stay at. Uh, the problem I have with it, now, this is not a snob thing, and it's not uh, anything other than what I'm trying to create for people when I take them out into the field is your parks board reserves, your nat national reserves, tend to be a lot busier. Way more vehicle traffic because, number one, the accommodation tends to be a bit cheaper because it's parks board accommodation. They are trying to get people in. It's a, it's a heritage for the country, natural heritage for the country. So that helps. Um, generally, the, the vehicle traffic is a lot heavier. Um, you end up getting things like tar roads. Not, not all of them, some. Um, tar roads, there's, it's well patrolled, you have to, there's, there's certain rules like you cannot go off road, you, you have to be back at your camp before sunset and you only leave after sunrise, things like that. So it is because of the amount of people they're putting through there, it's way more structured. Can you still have a great time? Hell yes, absolutely. Uh, I wrote a blog post quite a while ago um, where I looked, I, I drove through the Kruger, which is a, one of the national reserves. And it irritated the hell out of me with people doing what they want, stopping 50 people to a car. That being said, if you time it right, you can still have a great time in these reserves. But it's very different from a private reserve, which a private reserve, something like the Sabi Sands, private game reserve, Madikwe is a private game reserve. They are, it's a governing body locally, either sometimes provincially, otherwise just for those concessions that manage the product, manage that reserve. So there are more it's more aimed at the tourism side of things. I've got an interesting question I saw come in today on tourism and wildlife photography and how they meet. But the experience there that you can have, yes, it comes at a cost. Absolutely. A private reserve will come at a cost, but you get to go off-road in most instances. You can do night drives. You can go out pretty much any time. 
the, the, the numbers of vehicles in a sighting is limited. So for example, you will only ever have two, maybe three vehicles in any given sighting. So let's say you're watching lines, there's only three other vehicles, you and two other vehicles. Then when one leaves, another one will come in. So it's very controlled in order to maximize the guest experience. If, and this is a strange one, but if money isn't an issue, I would go private any day of the week because of that experience. It's the experience that drives us. It's the experience of wildlife photography that speaks to me and that I try and, well, create for my guests. So a private, a private reserve will always offer you a little bit more at a bit more of a cost, obviously, but don't dismiss the National Reserve. There are some beautiful places out there, and if you time it right and you kind of get the insider's info as to where to go, where not to go, which roads to drive, and so on and so forth, it can most definitely still be worth it. Carol asked on email, why is it so difficult to get detail of something black? Carol, this could be, whew, this is, this is um, trying to think how, where to go with this. Why, why is it so difficult to get black in an image? First off, let me do this, is a lot of people, uh, yeah, tough one, I'm trying to think what the easiest way is to do this. So, metering, do you spot meter or do you under and overexpose to get pitch black? Now, in photography theory, especially with black and white, you should have pure black and pure white in every image, which will give you the full spectrum. Not always the case, though. So, if you're taking, for example, a picture, you mentioned a scarlet-chested sunbird, which is pretty dark. You take a picture of that against a bright back sky, it's going to blow it out completely. Yes? You're not going to see any detail on that animal. It's going to look like a silhouette. Why is this? So, I'm going to do this. Carol, you've been on a course with me, so bear with me here. If I look at the frame, you're looking at, this, at the sunbird, and it's small in the big frame. How does metering work? Watch this. Imagine you could split, looking at, a, at, at your frame, you could take and divide it into five sections. Each of the corners and in the middle. So each of the corners and the middle has like its own little committee. Work with me here, yes? So when you point your camera at something, all of those committees in each of those five sections want to have a middle exposure, medium, yes? 18% gray. So what they do is, gray's in the middle, dark will obviously be under, and white will be over. So, when you point your camera at something, your sunbird might take up just the middle section of, that, uh, of those five committees. The other ones sit in the corner. Yeah? I'll, put it, I'll put a graph up here for you. So, when you then meter, half to press, and the camera decides how bright or dark to make this image, the corners, which sees the bright sky behind, says to your camera, no, this is very bright, we need to bring it a bit darker. Yeah? So, there's four of them saying, make this darker. The middle section of that camera sees the bird and say, okay, this is quite dark, let's make it a bit lighter to get it to medium gray. This is all inside the camera's, um, inside the camera's, camera's brain. So now you've got four corners saying make it darker, you've got the middle saying make it lighter, the four wins. And that entire image then gets underexposed a little bit to, go, to make sure that the bright areas are exposed correctly. Did that make sense? Otherwise rewind a bit and watch that again. No. So if you want to get that image of the, the sunbird and you want to get the black pure, either yes, you can spot meter on it, or you can manually. I choose to do manually over and underexpose. I keep my metering neutral all the time, and I just over and underexpose, knowing that if, I, if I've got a bright background and the sunbird, I need to overexpose. I need to push my exposure up to lift the darks up to get some detail on the blacks. It might burn out the sky, but that's the payoff for getting my bird details on my bird. I hope that makes sense. Now, the other option you have, but you guys must be very careful of this, is in Lightroom, once you've processed, process the entire image, Carol, for you, process the entire image until it looks great. If you then still have dark areas that have no detail, hit J on your keyboard in Lightroom, it'll show up as, as blue areas. You can use the shadow slider to lift that up, but be very, very careful. There's almost nothing, what's the only thing that's as bad? Dust spots and skew horizons is if someone overcooks the shadows and it makes it look fake because it lifts the dark areas up to give it some detail. That's a lot of information in three minutes. You might have to rewind and watch that again. Otherwise, Carol, drop me an email and I can actually do a Lightroom tutorial on this for you. How to get blacks in your camera. Hope that helps. Yeah, a lot of detail. I like these questions because we can build these into new tutorials and standalone videos. So questions like this, please keep them coming. Carol, good luck. Let me know how it goes. Mike asks on email, I sometimes seem to struggle with sharpness in my images. 
Is it the quality of camera you use and the ability to push the eye so high enough to get a fast enough shutter speed to ensure you get a sharp image that matters? Mike, I chose this question as well because it kind of links to the first one where we discussed um, ISO. Now, I, I'm just thinking now as we do this, it might be worth us. The, our website's going live next week, Monday. This is the new Wild Eye website. I'm going to do some blog posts on there, and there are some old ones, which I'm going to refer you to at some point to go and have a look at. But the question here, how big a role does ISO play in sharpness? It does. It absolutely does. But with technology changing and kind of moving on, it's becoming less and less of an issue. So again, like I mentioned earlier on, the heat that is the byproduct of the sensor warming up, that's the kind of heat haze. So imagine, imagine standing on a highway, very warm and you get a mirage, which is the heat rising up, and you get the kind of mottled look. So if you get that in an image, the more of that mottled heat you have in an image that the camera captures, it softens the, the detail behind it, so it absolutely makes a difference. Now again, you're saying you're having problems from 600 up, ISO, that starts looking like a, an, an oil painting. What are you taking pictures of? And again, maybe Athos, Zeta, from the first question as well, what are you taking pictures of? Because again, noise hides in dark areas. You can shoot at 1600 ISO, middle of the day outside, um, and bright, relatively neutral tone subjects, you're probably not gonna get any noise because there's nothing, there's, the camera doesn't have to struggle to render details from the dark areas. Um, so yes, I mean, for you to get sharp images, that's, that's the question revolves about the sharpness. So yes, ISO will play a part. Do you use your back button to focus? Go and just Google back button focus and you're gonna find one of our blog posts that Andrew did. And that for me is one of the biggest things with sharp images as well. So are you holding the camera correctly? Are you using back button focus? Are you managing your ISO so that it's as high as necessary but as low as possible? Um, if you're shooting longer focal lengths, are you using a bean bag or some kind of support? Those are all the kind of thing that, 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 that comes in with sharp images. But again, a sharp image, I'm gonna refer back to some of my clients who come to me in the past and say, oh, this is horrible images that I took with you on Safari. But then we sit down and we look at them neutrally without any emotions of the sighting, and it's actually not that bad. So again, Mike, if you want to, you emailed your question in. So if you want to email one, one of your images that you are questioning, I'd happily look at that on the side for you, and I'll email you back, and we can kind of figure out what went wrong. So send me the raw file again, and I will look at the shutter speed, the detail, and so on and so forth. And let's see if we can figure it out for you. But in order to get sharp images, shutter speed, one over focal length, let's go through them again. Back button focus is a winner. You have to do this. Support if necessary. Manage that ISO as best you can. And um, the speed of your subject, remember, if you're taking, I think you mentioned birds and flight animals running, those kind of things, especially on a longer lens, the, you might, you, you're going to need faster shutter speeds because if you're moving that big lens and the subject is moving, it might not be fast enough. So then you would need double and then you would have to push your ISO up. You see, the whole sharpness thing is the whole circle that falls together, but shutter speed is the main factor, and then all the other things I've mentioned will come in as well. So send me that image, send me a raw file, the one that you're questioning, and let's have a look and see what we can do with it. But um, yeah, go and go, Google back button focus for wildlife photography, and you should find Andrew's blog on our website, which is very handy. I would suggest you do that, and you all do that immediately. It's great, great, Great for wildlife photography. Alrighty, that is it for this episode. Now, here's the deal. I'm off, we're gonna do one more episode later in this week, probably on Thursday or Friday, we'll have that up for you. I'm off to Kenya on a Monday evening next week. Penny's coming with me, we're hosting eight guests up in Kenya, Masa Mara, Lake Nakuru, Lake Navasha, and Amboseli. It's a fantastic itinerary. And I'm gonna try and do one or two, well, try one for now, episode of this Q&A series from the Mara for you. So, if you have any specific destination or photo safari or wildlife photography questions that you would like, myself, Penny will be there so I can pull her in if necessary, that we can answer for you from Kenya next week. I'll be there for probably like two and a half weeks or so. Then send them through. I would like to answer them from Kenya, get some different backgrounds to the office. I'm trying to make the backgrounds look different. So, get some different natural looking backgrounds in there and I can answer your wildlife photography questions from the field. Won't be live, I'm gonna try and get up like a day or so later, so let's see what we can do. 
You can ask your questions, not just for this, for the Kenya episode. Keep sending me your wildlife photography questions, and you can do this on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and by email. The details are at the end of this video. Now, just before I go, again, guys, thank you so much. The support and the feedback from the series has been amazing. It is really, really cool to know. We love what we do here. It is, I'm passionate about this whole thing, and the sharing idea is incredible. So, Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the emails and the details that you guys have been sending through. Keep going. Let's see how far we can take this. Now, I need you to subscribe as well, please. Subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we're going to be pushing a lot more content through there very, very shortly. So hit this button, bah, and subscribe so you don't miss anything in future. You keep asking your wildlife photography questions, and I will try to keep on answering them for you. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. I will see you next time.